Hello to everybody. I am Marco Beato, Associate Professor in Sport and Exercise Science. Today, I have the pleasure to uh, present you Lawrence Bloom. And uh, Lawrence, uh, we will, will talk about uh, building a career in sports science and how to succeed. Thank you, Lawrence. Hi, Marco. Uh, thanks for inviting me along to um, speak to you and your students um, and give some of my own personal insights and experiences um, in regards to building a career and working as a sports scientist um, in a professional industry. So thank you for the invite and I look forward to hopefully sharing some, some useful information with you guys. Um, like you said, really, the, the, the main sort of purpose of this presentation is to sort of give an overview and insight, um, a little bit about my background uh, in regards to sort of how I started and where I came from to, to get where I am now as head of performance at Millwall Football Club and also sort of probably talk about some mistakes and, and sort of issues I've had along the way and, and having to learn from those. So hopefully the information I can provide will be based on some of my own personal experiences, um, both positive and negatives, but also I've worked with a lot of um, graduates coming out of university within internships or uh, working as an assistant role um, within the department um, underneath myself. So again, sharing maybe drawing on experiences from people I've worked with and, and undergrads and postgrads coming out as well. Um, so, so that's the purpose. Again, if there's any questions, I think Marco is going to fire some questions at the end. So again, hopefully they'll be, be useful for you guys. So first of all, if I just talk you through, um, again, I don't want this to become all about my background, but just to give you a little bit of an insight of, of where I came from, what I've done um, up until this point in my career. Um, so going back to sort of pre-university, didn't really know what I wanted to do, finish school, ended up going to college and doing a BTEC uh, diploma in sports science, as opposed to maybe more of a traditional A-level route. Um, and that was something I really found as sparked an interest for me, um, which then obviously spoke me to sort of specialise in the field, um, going off to university, um, went to Middlesex University, actually did a degree in sports rehabilitation and injury prevention back then. And that was in 2000. So it seems like a long time ago now, um, but time's flown pretty quickly since then. Uh, so that, that was sort of my undergrad, um, say four year, four year degree. Within that, I had two work placements, which which were really beneficial probably for my career moving forward. Uh, one of them was a specialist placement, which I went to America um, and did um, an internship essentially within the University of San Diego, and we had to do a clinical placement as well, uh, which all spent sort of four or five months working in a sort of private physio clinic. Again, both good experiences for different reasons and, and help sort of sort of beg my knowledge and, and get some experience in different sort of fields, uh, which again was, was really useful moving forward. Um, following university, after a short spell trying to decide, you know, or find a career option, um, I ended up getting my first opportunity within professional sport, uh, working with Southend United, which was my local sort of football club at the time. Um, and that really started off from a part-time point of view, evenings and weekends working with, with the academy set up. So working through from sort of under eights to under 15s, um, very basic provision in terms of, you know, you get half an hour a week with each age group going in and doing some, some movement competency drills, some sort of speed and agility type drills on the pitch. Um, but again, for me, I found that as, as coming out of university, wanting to get straight into elite sport, um, I found that actually quite a good way to sort of break yourself in as a practitioner um, and, and a good place to be able to actually make some mistakes before you go got further up in, in your career or further up on the ladder. Um, so for me, I spent a little bit of time doing that, which was a good experience. And then that sort of evolved uh, sort of gradually into working in a more full-time capacity within the club. So working then up to the under 18s. Um, and at that point, they're, they're full scholarship. So they're on a full-time programme for their football and for their education. Um, so I got involved in sort of both elements of that. So part of my role was um, overseeing the sports science provision um, from sort of 18s all the way still down to the younger age groups, but also part of the academic or education process or program with the, with the scholars as well. They were studying sort of BTEC, sports science and stuff alongside as, as, as playing football as well. Um, and again, that gave me quite a holistic sort of round, rounded approach to then moving on in my career. Again, progressed quite well, staying in the same club, um, moved up then to a first team role. So I was quite lucky at a time coming through in sports science where the industry wasn't as saturated as it was now, um, and it was obviously a lot newer, uh, more in its infancy at that time. And, and a lot of clubs, even at professional levels, especially as you sort of went down the leagues, didn't really have um, sports science or, or provision in place. So 
luckily for me, there was, there was no one already in a role in, in, in the position in the club. So it was a bit of a natural progression from actually working up um, and then working to the first team, which was there. There's a my own sort of first experience of sports science at that level as such. So again, for me, it was a, it was a bit thrown in at the deep end um, and a very different experience than, than maybe I was expecting. Uh, I had to learn on my feet and, and adjust and adapt my sort of practice very quickly um, to the surroundings. Again, totally different than working with an academy group when you step up to that first team level. Huge differences in terms of your practice, how you approach it, and, and also the pressures within the role as well. So they become totally different challenges from working with 18 players where you're trying to develop them. Um, developing athletes, still still part of the LTAD. You know, you have time, there's no real pressure. Um, whereas when you step into that first team environment and it becomes much less about development and more about results driven uh, week to week. Um, so when you look at your sort of traditional periodization models, a lot of things can go out the window very quickly working in the first team level. Uh, and that's something I had to learn and adapt to. Um, it's, I think it's different now because I think as students, you come out and, you know, you, the likelihood of stepping into that situation without having some previous experience or some sort of guidance would be a lot less, uh, you know, a lot less chance of that happening. So I had to sort of learn, teach myself, um, think on my feet, which in some ways was good. In other ways, it was, it was a challenge in terms of not having someone who'd had that experience to mentor me or guide me through that. Um, but one thing I did at that time, obviously trying to work and apply your knowledge and and then at times, you know, you realise how little you actually do know coming out from your undergraduate programme, but then inspired me to go on and do a master's degree. So I went to Salford University, did an MSc in strength conditioning, which again, I found at that time uh, useful combining the two together. So opposing to go straight from my undergrad to my postgrad and not being able to apply any of that, I actually found it really useful in terms of then taking information I was learning on my master's degree and actually applying it uh, and filtering through what was relevant and what wasn't relevant and being able to apply that in the sort of role that I was currently working in. So again, they sort of complemented each other quite well. I think then by that point, um, with having sort of four or five years experience and sort of having my undergrad and my master's, sort of I've noticed then that I was probably at a point then when I was ready to maybe, maybe progress my career a little bit more. And fortunately for me, um, an opportunity came up at Charlton Athletics. So I actually got um, headhunted by the manager there through a, a personal recommendation, which was nice. And when I went to the first team at Charlton, first, first year there was probably, I would say, my most enjoyable year working in professional football. Um, very lucky in the fact that, you know, I came into a good team um, that had a bit of investment in the squad that season. First year there, we, we got promotion to the championship, record points, and, you know, really, you know, really unbelievable season. So that was great. Um, spent about five and a half years in that position and again it wasn't all rosy a few ups and downs along the way which is you know a lot of stories but I'll save those for another day and obviously spent spent you know a good good part of my career and and time and investment in, my, in myself during that period in terms of my development work, working with that position it was a slightly higher level than I previously worked at, at South End um, and again came with different challenges and experiences along the way the one thing I probably had at Charlton, which I didn't have at South End, is then I actually had the opportunity to build a department around me to work with. So, you know, we'd have um, assistant sports scientists, we'd have part-time sort of strength conditioning coaches, um, part-time nutritionists and interns as well. So that was my real first then experience of, of not just being a head of the part or just a head of fitness or working with the players, is actually then just managing a department as well. Um, so again, different challenges along the way there. Following that, um, an opportunity to go to Nottingham Forest came up. So I'd been quite lucky in my career up to that point where being relatively stable in terms of the position that I'd been in. Um, an opportunity came to Nottingham Forest, which at the time I felt was, was too good to turn down. Um, unfortunately, I was a managerial appointment again. And within a very short period of time of me, me starting there, the manager actually lost his job, um, which resulted in, in me also sort of losing my job as well. So... That's probably, you know, when you look at working in professional sport, particularly football, um, unfortunately, these things can happen. But, you know, I've, I've been quite lucky to that point where, where I hadn't really been in that situation. So, again, that was a huge, you know, eye opener. And you go through a little bit of concern and worry at that period in, in your life, um, especially when you have sort of family and a mortgage. So it puts a little bit more pressure on you um, to, to, to maybe not be in that situation. But... You know, like anything, I think, you know, you work hard and, and you strive to come through that. So managed to find another opportunity again through a player I previously worked with um, at, at Southend United and then become the Millwall manager. And, and luckily there was an opportunity for me to go and work with him, um, a guy called Neil Harris. So 
Um, went into Millwall in 2016, I believe it was now, so five years ago again. So I've seen to five, six years seems to be roughly the length of time I've been at a club, um, which is quite quite good for this type of industry. Um, again, good, good first year there. So we got promoted via the playoffs that season um, up into the championship. And we've spent probably the last yeah, four, four seasons now back in the championship and, and generally doing OK. So, um, again, probably for me, progressions through, through different clubs and, and progressions within the roles as well. So at Charlton Athletic, I was sort of head of sports science um, and same at Forest. But then obviously when I went to Millwall, sort of the job role changed a little bit and, and become more ahead of performance role. So more overseeing the medical sports science, uh, bigger department, bigger team. And again, a little bit more responsibility um, from the performance and, and injury side of things as well. Um, so, so that's a little bit of an oversight to sort of my background, how, how I got to where I am now. Um, and again, by no means is that is that the perfect route to, to get where you want to go and achieve your goals. Uh, but also along the way, I probably haven't touched on there, but sort of numerous sort of CPD, um, external qualifications that, that I've picked up along the way just to help support my practice and, and sort of you know, be a better professional or better practitioner along the way. So for me, again, when I was talking to, to Marco about this presentation, it was really about, you know, what, what, what would you guys want to know? What's important information? What's relevant? And I just reflected on the fact, well, when I, when I was in my sort of third or fourth year at university, what would I have wanted to tell myself? What would I have told my younger self? And maybe I was in a position where, where I had someone come in and, and do a presentation like this. But often the, the common questions I get asked by either students or, or graduates, um, in particular interns at uh, you know, how do I get my foot in the door? You know, how do I get an opportunity within, whether it's football or, or another sport, how, how do I get that first step on a ladder? Um, which is obviously a, a really important question. You know, what further qualifications do I need? So, you know, often I'll get, you know, do I need to have a master's before I try and apply for jobs? Or, you know, do I need to have any other specialist qualifications before I can get an opportunity? Um, which I'll touch on more as we go. Um, what other experiences do I need? What's going to help me to, to get an opportunity? Should I specialise, you know, try and specialise in one sport or are I better off trying to get, you know, experiences in multi or, you know, multi sports and, and different areas? And then obviously other key ones, you know, how do you set yourself apart from, from other people? As I said, now, unfortunately, the industry has become probably more and more saturated over the last, definitely since I've been in it. So over the last 10 years, um, a lot more applicants for each position. Um, generally at the moment, obviously, with, with COVID and everything, obviously positions are, are difficult and limited. Um, so really, how, how do you set yourself from other people that are going to be applying for the same positions as yourself? And you know, a lot of times people ask me as well, you know, when I'm recruiting or you know, when I'm looking for a member of staff, what, what are the key traits I'm looking for? And you know, what are the standout things there that, that I think are important um, as a head of department? So I'll try and touch on those as we go. So apologies, there's a few arrows in there, so I've not set up my slide great here. But um, so first thing where, where you guys are here is, is obviously you're doing your undergraduate degree. For me, like I said, I think the experiences I got during my degree uh, were invaluable in terms of moving forward and, and helping me sort of progress through my career. Um, obviously, different ways you can do this. Um, you know, if you've got the opportunity to do a work placement alongside your degree, um, you know, whatever that may be, whether that's working within a sport, within a club, uh, within a gym, within a health club. I think any, any experience you can get where you're sort of delivering coaching exercises, communicating with people, um, you know, it's loads of different skill sets you can get from, from different experiences. So it doesn't have to necessarily be in, in your chosen sport or field you want to go in. Um, and then alongside that, you know, practical experience. So if you can get an opportunity to, to go and volunteer, whether that whether some of your local sports club, local football club, hockey club, wherever that may be, um, put yourself out there and, and try and get some, some practical experience. And then obviously alongside that as well, um, Sort of uh, industry qualification so you know you want to be sort of getting your degree which, which is your foundation but also you know if you want to specialize in a certain sport so i'll go back to to when i sort of graduated through my coaching badges my level two in particular it's only a basic but you know, when you're working with coaches day in day out if you have a little bit of a background and understanding within the actual sport coaching element of, that can help you in your career as well uh, moving forward and i think it's just a good Good thing to have alongside other qualifications that you're going to have, um, whether that's sort of personal training qualification. So what I didn't mention going back to is, is I spent throughout my degree, um, I got sort of my fitness qualifications, PT qualifications quite early. And I spent probably the majority of my, my 
got probably from second, third and fourth year working as a personal trainer at David Lloyd um, alongside doing my degree. So all that time, you know, was about helping make a little bit of money as well. But looking back at it now, that probably helped me develop my sort of coaching skills, were, you know, just working with people and, and developing those soft skills, whether that's sort of communication, uh, communication or whether that is actually coaching um, exercises and working with different people and different people's abilities and movement patterns. You, know, you can learn a lot from that. So again, that was just the route that, that I felt helped me. You know, it's not necessarily the only way, um, but a good way to get some, some coaching experience. So obviously natural progression would be, obviously after you've done your undergrad, got some experience. Um, I've had a lot of interns also that, that come out and would do almost a gap year. So they'll finish their undergrad, they'll want to be doing their master's degree, but what they'll tend to do is sandwich in maybe a year's internship in between. And, and I think either doing it that way or doing your master's degree alongside either an internship or, you know, like I did as a, within a paid position, I think works really well because students I tend to see that have come straight out from doing undergrad and postgrad, they have the academic, they have, they have the qualifications, they have the knowledge, but in terms of their understanding of how to apply that knowledge within the field um, can be very limited. So, you know, often I said, I get asked the question is, you know, would you rather take someone with a year's experience or with a master's degree? Now, again, there's no right or wrong and there's a lot of individual factors, but for me, I think the person with the, the year's experience is going to be a little bit more ready to work in the field. So they're probably going to be a little bit ahead. Um, ideally, obviously, if you combine the two and you have your master's and you have some experience, whether that's sort of voluntary experience, coaching experience, whatever that may be, then obviously that's going to stand you, you in better stead as well. So I think the two sort of go hand in hand really well. Um, but don't neglect getting experience for purely going down the academic route and, and trying to get all your qualifications at once before you had a chance to actually apply the skill set and the knowledge that you're learning in, in a practical environment. I think that, that's pretty key for me. Um, so normally you said either alongside or afterwards, if you can get either an internship or a graduate assistant role. Um, and like I said, I wasn't in a position at the time because it was early on in, in, in sort of sports science sort of feel really I didn't get an opportunity to have have a real mentor or someone to work underneath but for me that's an area I feel like I probably missed out on um, if you have the opportunity to do that now whether that has, is as, as a you know assistant or whether that's an intern then I'd say that's a, definitely a valid route to go down to to get that experience and have someone that you can feed off and it's going to help guide you and mentor you sort of through the process of becoming a you know, sports scientist strength conditioning coach uh, practitioner whatever sort of route you want to go down really um and then alongside that obviously with your masters you've got your professional accreditations which you know we're all aware of again you know these fit quite nicely well doing these whilst you're working in the field and, and while you're getting that experience so things like bases ukca accreditation um or even why I, I did nsca um many years ago now but again good one to have and may op you know offer more opportunities um abroad as well if, you, if you're looking at opportunities um, there's a lot of job opportunities now coming out in the States for S&C coaches. So if that's something you feel is going to be relevant for you as you in your career, then you know, it's probably worth getting something like your NSCA um, accreditation. And also, I've like, just had a colleague, uh, an ex-colleague of mine go over to Australia um, as head of performance in Melbourne. And he's now going to go and do his, A his ASCC, um, Australian Strength Conditioning Accreditation, um, to be able to sort of validate his, his position over there. So these are all further qualifications depending on you know, where you see yourself and what your goals and ambitions are of, you know, start thinking about these things now. And then sort of further down the line, when you get to Marco's level, you can be considering your, your doctorate or your PhD, and then maybe going into a more sort of specialist role, whether that's you know, sports nutrition, strength conditioning, um, psychology, exercise physiology, obviously all these different routes. So obviously it depends, you know, where you see yourself as a specialist or a generalist. Um, again, we'll probably talk about it a little bit more as we go. Um, but then these are further down the line in terms of your development and your career pathway and it's sort of your route to get into that point that's important for me and that comes down to yes having your qualifications but you know getting that experience and working earning the right to progress um, sort of up the career ladder really and then even when you get to that point uh, you know as everyone will tell you it never stops I think CPD now it, it's, it's, it's just you know, imperative that you sports science moves so fast and you can easily get left behind. So I think just staying on top of your own sort of professional development, whether that's just through reading journals, keeping keeping up to date with the latest research, 
so much of my CPD now is on social media, um, just through my lack of time to, to go away and find articles and research them. And I might see a little post on social media and it looks interesting, catches my eye. I'll jump on it and there's a little link to a paper or a study and, and, and I'll do it that route. So it's, it's making it work around your constraints and your time um, commitments as well. Obviously, in normal times, you know, going on workshops and attending workshops, most stuff's been done online at the moment. So, you know, just, just jumping on those where, where available. A lot of good free ones still about as well. So it's, it's always worth sort of keeping an eye on what's going on. And also just networking and, and speaking to other practitioners is all, also um, a good one and share, sharing ideas. So um, again, a lot of information on the slide, but, you know, this isn't the, the only route you can go down to, to get from where you are now to, to maybe where your end goal is and where you want to be. But, you know, this is the sort of probably route I'd recommend in terms of, you know, combining your education with you, with your practical experience. And, and I said, you know, this, this can last many years. I've been, I've been in the industry for probably 15, 16 years now, but still developing, still learning, and, and it never ends. Um, and the more you think you know, the less you probably actually know. So you've got to keep on top of it, keep learning, um, and keep developing, really. So one thing we sort of like touched on is, you know, I get, get a lot of students coming out now saying they finished my degree, um, I want to be a sports nutritionist. So they go and do a master's in sports nutrition, which then I'm not saying, you know, isn't the right way to do something. For me, I think you're better off having a more well-rounded grasp to start with. So again, if you can get some experience, again, whether that's paid or voluntary, working as a generalist sports scientist first to to sort of fully understand, understand the whole industry and the constraints of, of that position before you become a specialist. So um, I think I've seen it before, again, from, from my own personal experience, where as a sports scientist, you are pretty much a jack of all trades. And some of the things you get realmed into doing on a day-to-day, -day, week-to-week basis can be things that you wouldn't even think of uh, as an undergrad at, at university. So, um, you know, you become a kit man, a chef, um, you know, even to this day, I, I prep food for the players on the coach after an away game. So, you know, skills outside of what you think you're going to need to know. Um, you know, sometimes you're out helping a kit man before a game, put the kit out, you know, collecting boots up. Um, there's a lot of things that go within the role that probably you don't, don't expect, we don't realise, but I think that's just part and parcel of working within professional sport. You have to be adaptable and have to be a good team player as well. And, and that can be chipping in with, with all sorts of things. So... I think if you haven't been ex exposed to that, to then go and specialise as, as a practitioner and then try and work with, as part of a multidisciplinary team, maybe don't fully understand the constraints or the realms of what the other person's got to work in. So I think it's always good to go in as a generalist, uh, learn the role, understand relationships within that role as well. So, you know, who else, you know, who else are your key stakeholders that you have to work with? So, you know, we have coaches, uh, we have the groundsmen, we have the kitsmen, uh, kitmen, sorry. We have kitchen staffs or chefs that we're, we're working with. You're also maybe reporting to um, HR. You're probably reporting to the CEO sometimes. So you've got, you know, you're this little cog in the middle of all this other stuff going around you. And I think really good to get a good base experience working within that sort of generalist role um, before you try and specialise in, in one discipline, such as nutrition, for example. Um, so again, it's just a little slide here, you know, generalist versus, versus specialist. Um, but as you can see, the generalist here, you know, you're more prepared for a much wider range of circumstances, like I said, and, and situations that you're going to come under. You may have more limited resources all around. Um, and a lot of stuff you go into can be relatively unknown and you end up, like I said, doing things that you don't understand or you have to go and read about. Um, and it can challenge you a little bit more as a practitioner. Whereas obviously when you're a specialist, you're only really homing in on one field. So for example, as a sports nutritionist, you're literally going in, you're working with one player, maybe two players or a sports scientist, and you're just delivering one key area of expertise. So it's a lot more sort of fine-tuned. Your knowledge probably needs to be much more in depth. Um, and that's where obviously you, you're studying an academia will come into it. Um, so for me, um, well, I said there, there's a little paper I read against generalists tend to do better than specialists. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that, as there's obviously a lot of specialists out there that are doing unbelievable work and, and made a good career for themselves, whether that's within sports nutrition, sports psychology. Uh, and there are more and more opportunities now within sports science, whether that's in football or other sports. Um, there are more specialist opportunities coming up. 
uh, especially at the higher levels. So, you know, the further you go down the leagues, or in, in football particularly, but, you know, League Two, it's very unlikely that you're going to have um, a specialist psychologist or a specialist sports nutritionist. You'll probably find that the sports scientist will be a jack of all trades and doing a little bit of everything, you know, doing a bit of sports nutrition, doing a bit of S&C, doing a bit of data analysis, doing a bit of hydration testing, and covering multiple areas. Obviously, the higher you go up the chain, you get to the Premier League and, you know, you've got massive teams, say at Man City, where you've probably got two or three nutritionists, a couple of sports psychologists, a couple of exercise physiologists, maybe five or six S&C coaches. You've got a huge team of people around you with all their own sort of specialist areas. So, Yes, there are opportunities as specialists, um, but I say there's a lot more opportunities as generalists. And I say that's always a good place to, to start and then sort of hone your career and specialise in a particular subject area of interest, I would say. As I said, sports scientists, we know, generalists, bit of a jack of all trades, um, yeah, good place to cut your teeth. For me, I always look at sort of a strength conditioning coach as a generalist specialist. So they tend to sit as get used interchangeably with the term sports scientist. So for me, it's a specialist area in terms of, you know, what, what you're studying, what you're learning, what you're delivering, it's quite specialist. But again, I think as an SNC coach, you then get tend to pull in that sports science hat where, you know, you'll get asked about nutrition, you'll get asked about physiology, you know, you're working on someone with players. So, you know, you might end up becoming a little bit of a counselor or understand that a bit of sports psych might come into it. So again, it is a specialist area, but it almost becomes a, Generally, specialist for me. There are real sort of specialist roles I've talked about there. Um, you may have physiologists, um, psychologists, performance nutritionists, and bio, biomechanists, really. And a lot of these guys, minus probably sports performance nutritionists, you're probably going to find more in your sort of like university or real high elite setups, not so much in your sub elite environments. Uh, but again, all great you know, career pathways to sort of follow if that's. If that's your interest, but for me, I think it's key to you know become a good special, a good generalist, sorry, before you specialise in a particular field. Um, I think that, that's a key bit of information. So we're talking about a little bit about specialism here. Another one I sort of looked at, and a bit of a random slide this, but um, sports specialisation for practitioners. So if you look at my career history, you'll see that obviously everything I've done is in football, and I've probably become very pigeonholed to that environment. So if you now took, if I took myself out of that environment and put me into a different sport or a different environment, I'd probably really struggle and be out of my depth. So I think if you threw me into rugby, which is a sport I'm quite interested in, but I have no idea about the culture, the etiquette, um, the day-to-day -day working environment in that industry, um, you know, I'd probably really have to struggle to adapt to that. Um, so probably one limitation in, in my career, looking back, um, if I'd gone back in time, I'd maybe have tried to establish more experiences in different sports to get a bit more of like a well-rounded approach. I think we treat it as like, you know, if you look at long-term athletic development models for, for kids that are young athletes, you know, trying to avoid early specialization is key in terms of trying to develop as an all-round athlete or all-round practitioner. If you're only ex exposing yourself to one environment or one certain set of skill set, um, I think you're limiting your opportunities, uh, especially this day and age, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm from a, Bit of a stone age where things were a little bit easier in terms of getting opportunities i think it's become more difficult now um and the more sort of well-rounded well-balanced you are as a practitioner and you know more more sort of experiences you can draw from either different sports or different environments yeah it's definitely going to help you moving forward as a practitioner um so if, even when i recruit now um you know i don't like to just employ people that have only worked in football i like to have you know employ people that maybe have worked in, in rugby and athletics um, netball, hockey, whatever it may be, because I think there's a lot of added value that can give to uh, a graduate or practitioner coming into football um, and draw on those experience. The only difficult thing is if you're going into a new environment, like I said there, from working in football and my understanding of working in other sports, that the culture and the environment within those sports can be very, very different, even though sports may seem quite similar from the outset. Um, so I think wherever environment you have to go into or whatever industry you go into, you have to quickly learn and understand the environment and the, et and the etiquette of that environment you're working in and how, how you may speak to coaches and your relationships with players might be very different in, in two different sports or, or industries. Um, so that's why I think the more, more experience you can get, the better that's going to make you as a practitioner. Um, 
So I couldn't really find the slide on, on specialising as a practitioner in sports science. So this was the closest I can get in terms of relating that to actually an athlete in terms of if you're only specialising in one sport, you're definitely limiting the, the skills and probably your, your development of, of other areas of expertise you're going to get. So obviously another point on this slide really is, you know, we talk about opportunities, experiences, education, and how to sort of get on the run or a scientist or a practitioner. I think the key thing is then, you know, how do you know be successful? Um, so first of all, how do we, you know, how would you define success? And for me, it's just the accomplishment um, of your aim or your purpose. So, you know, if your aim is to work as a strength conditioning coach in professional football, that's very different to someone that wants to be head of performance for UK athletics, for example, and, and your career pathways and the education is probably going to be slightly different across the two. Um, so for me, this probably comes down to you being able to set your own goals uh, and mapping out your own pathway in terms of where you're at now, your long-term goal of, of where you see yourself or where you want to be, whether that's in 10, 15, 20 years' time, and then almost working back from that. So then what are your medium-term goals? You know, How does that fit into your long-term goal? And then bringing that right down to sort of your short-term goals over the next sort of 12 to 18 months. So once you finish your degree, you know, what, what's your next step? You know, is it going on to do your master's degree? Is it, you know, to do an internship? Is it to try and gain, you know, paid experience within, within a paid role? So there's, there's lots of different opportunities and, and options for you. Um, but I think it's understanding, you know, your end goal first, you know, and what, what's going to be your, your route of least resistance to get there, I would say. Because there's lots of terminology within not just working in professional sport or working in sports science, but to be successful in life, that there's a lot of, terms that you can throw out there so on, on the left here you'll see that there's the iceberg of the success then underneath that everything that underpins that to sort of make a successful personal practitioner so given the obvious hard work so for me um you know i'll be the first one to admit i've never been the most educated the most knowledgeable or probably the best practitioner out there um, but one thing that's probably helped me along the way is just having a good work ethic and you know putting in the hours you know like I said, it goes back to my first job where, where I was at South End working in the academy. That was only a part-time role. I was, I was also working as a personal trainer. I was doing a bit of lecturing at a local college. Um, I was doing a bit of work as, as, a, as a private sort of sports therapist, massage therapist. Um, so, you know, I had five or six different jobs going on at one time that you're trying to juggle. Um, and that, that's just a huge demand on your life. But at that point, it was about doing what I needed to do to get to where I am today. Um, Again, it's gaining more opportunities, but at that time for me as well, it was about earning money. So um, you have to do what you've got to do at that time and, and that come down to hard work. Um, persistence, like I said, you know, is a difficult market at the moment to get into. So if you're applying for opportunities, applying for jobs, and you maybe feel you're not getting where you want to go, you know, don't give up, just keep, keep trying and, you know, maybe try and explore different avenues and reach out to different people as well. Um, one good thing about social media these days, people are more accessible now. So... You know, find out who are the relevant people in, in the field, make make some connections and reach out and speak to people. You know, there's a lot of good practitioners out there now that will take the time to, to speak to you or, or help you along the way. And, and that, that sort of filters in with rejections and, and stuff as well. In terms of working in professional sport, probably the key word that jumps out of me there is sacrifices. Um, so again, this is probably another presentation for another uh, another another day. But you know, one thing you have to understand when, when you're working is it's not just a job, it's a life, a lifestyle. And having worked in it for a long time now, I've missed many Christmases, many birthdays, um, you know, stag do's, weddings along the way, just because you're limited and you can't just take time off from the job. You, you know, you're tired for the season. So our season runs from pretty much June to, well, sorry, probably end of June to beginning of July, all the way through to May. So 10 months of the year, you know, you, you're married to the job. Um, Luckily, I've got a patient wife who understands that and uh, doesn't give me too much grief, but I think she's used to it now. So there are a lot of sacrifices along the way and, and, it, and that's what it takes to, to get to where you want to be. And, and criticism there as well, well is a big one, um, whether that's from peers, whether that's from athletes or players that you're working with, or probably more so coaches as well. So you've got to be able to, to take criticism and, uh, and deal with that in, in the right way and, and whether you take it on board and, and adapt as a practitioner or whether you're able to just bounce that off and, and not make it relevant. Um, and along the way, like I said, failure there's another big one. So, you know, my opportunity or my experience at Nottingham Forest, 
uh, was probably one I look back and look as a failure where I went there thinking it was a great opportunity for a job, a huge club with you know, a lot of tradition, you know, good history and went there and, and for situations out of my control um, was a failure in terms of an opportunity for me. Um, but, you know, going in and making another opportunity at the back of that was, was, was probably key and finding another, you know, not giving up and thinking, right, I'm done. You know, I had to go and find another job and luckily I was in the right place at the right time as well. So, um, just got to keep working hard and, and keep trying really along the way. So I think the, the key things, and I said, if, if I was going to speak to myself as, as a young practitioner coming out of university, what would I tell myself now? So I think key things, developing your communication and personal skills are massive. Um, again, students coming out of university, I've seen a lot of them probably lack in this area, whether that's because they haven't had applied experience of, of coaching or of working with other people. And you come into an environment where if you can't communicate well, whether that's with other members of the department or whether that's with your athletes or coaches, you know, you're really going to struggle to, to, to develop and, and move forward as a practitioner. So, you know, really work on, on these sort of skills as, as much as you can. And the best way to do that is by, by working with people and, and communicating with other people. Like I said, gaining as much experience as possible, preferably within different sports, different fields, different industries. Um, it's going to give you more strings to your bow. So again, you know, focus on that. Um, one thing I didn't have, as I said, was having a mentor. So whether that's someone, uh, one of the university lecturers, someone like Marco, or that can help you along the route, uh, whether it's having, working as part of a department and having someone within your department that you can um, sort of build a relationship with and, and sort of have a, have a mentorship with, that'd be great. Uh, there are obviously all these other mentorships out there that you can sort of find, but just be careful and, and try and find and go with someone that you can actually um, trust and work closely with. Like I said, I think having, having a planned pathway, so, so map out your career goals, really, you know, have you know, have a focus, have something to work towards, because I think the practitioner now you're coming out, it can be a little bit overwhelming, and not, you know, it's an unknown sort of entity where you're going to be in five, 10 years time, but unless you have like a direction to work towards, you know, it's, it's difficult to get to where you want to be. Um, and then map that out. So, you know, if you want to be head of performance at Man United in 15 years, you know, what are you going to do to get there? What's the process going to look like? Um, what do you need? You know, wh wh which connections do you need to help you achieve that? And these things you need, you need to put down on paper and sort of, you know, break that down in terms of your short term and, and medium term goals. Like I said, put yourself out there, have to go the extra mile. I think, again, talk about setting yourself aside for, for other graduates that are going to be coming out, applying for the same sort of jobs you're applying for. Um, the more willing you are to, to, to put yourself out, to volunteer, to do stuff, to, to gain experience, that's only going to help you uh, in the long term. The other things, again, I, I was probably very guilty of this coming out of university. Um, my first role, particularly working when I stepped up from working in the academy to the first team, um, having not been in that position before and, and fully understanding the dynamic of first team football, I came in thinking, right, I'm an s &C coach, I'm a sports scientist, I've got all this knowledge, you know, I'm going to be the difference here between sort of success and failure. You know, ultimately it's now about me um, and what I'm going to do with this team and, and how much better I'm going to make them. And quite quickly, you, know, you can realise it's not that easy and you're only a small cog in part of, part of a bigger will, um, essentially. So, you know, understand your role and, and how much influence you're actually having within that, within that department or within that club or environment you're working within. Um, you know, leave your ego at the door, don't take it in with you. Um, it's about working, it's part of a team, it's about, you know, you're there to support the players and, and, and other staff that you're working with. So essentially, we're just part of the support system. You know, we may be 2%, 5% of the bigger picture. And I think the earlier you understand that and, you know, don't try and go into your first role and, re you know, reinvent the wheel. Um, don't be a bull in a china shop, just, just take it on board and sort of, try and get your ethos and philosophy across um, in a subtle and, and slow way. Again, I think the biggest thing I, I've probably learned to do, again, going back to my early years as a practitioner, I was like, right, I've just learned Olympic lifting. I want everyone snatching. Um, I want every 20 of my first team players snatching, whether they're 18 or whether they're 36. Um, again, that was just because not having experience in the industry and going purely off research and, and what I learned along the way is you're thinking, right, if I can get everyone cleaning their own body weight, you know, we're going to be 
absolute specimens. We're going to be ripping up the league. And it just doesn't work like that. You know, you have to understand the athletes, what you're working with in terms of their training age, um, their, their philosophy on, on training. You know, if you, if you come into a, a new environment, you've got a 36-year-old athlete who's never lifted in their life. Uh, maybe Olympic lifting isn't isn't the, isn't the one for them. Um, but I'm a big believer there's some, something out there for everyone. Um, and it's just making your programming or your philosophy fit around the individual athletes you're working with. Um, and again, that, that comes with experience, but also, you know, being adaptable and flexible with, with your own approach as well. Yeah, like I said before as well, CPD. So taking care of your own sort of professional development, whether that's reading around sort of research papers within your field or whether that's going further outside and, you know, learning about other, other areas that maybe you don't know about or, you know, that are going to be relevant in the future. And again, one thing I sort of have struggled with along the way, and that's why I try and have good data scientists around me, um, not probably my forte is, is being IT literate. So I'd say one thing I'd probably go back now, um, I'd probably have put myself on an Excel course or something further in my career, further down in my career, um, as it's something now I sort of still struggle with and uh, probably left behind with a lot of these whiz kids now coming out with uh, amazing computer skills. So being, yeah, being, being IT literate now, the way things are going, we have so much um, data collection now. It's something I was talking to Marco about, you know, we have uh, GPS data, which, which, you know, we get so thousands and thousands of metrics, uh, millions of data sets coming through from that. You know, we have things now like we have four stacks, nor boards, um, you know, drawing bars and stuff. So we're collecting so much data on players and the more efficient you can be at actually, you know, utilising the data and visualising that data, but also presenting that data back to the players and coaches you're working with. Um, it's just going to make your job a lot, a lot easier and a lot more time efficient. So that's something I would have told myself many years ago if I knew sports science was going to go the way it has. And just, just ultimately, I think, you know, one, one thing I say to to my team and my department is a bit of an all blacks mentality of just no dickheads really. So, you know, we want good people. You know, I don't necessarily always employ the best who I think is the, the best practitioner or the most experienced practitioner. Ultimately, it's going to be someone that's going to fit in as part of our department, that wants to move forward, that wants to learn, wants to develop and shows a hunger for that and, you know, can just fit in and, and be part of that. Again, just don't like people coming in with egos and stuff like that at all. So, I think, you know, ultimately, if, if you feel a good person, you have a good understanding, you, you're knowledgeable um, and you've got some good experiences, it's really going to help you along the way. Um, and that's probably my sort of key golden nuggets of information, really. I don't know, Marco, if there's anything um, from your point of view, I've tried to sort of cover as, as much as I can there in the period of time, but is there anything you want me to elaborate on? Honestly, your presentation has been brilliant from my point of view. So all the questions that they prepare, in some way, you, you answer to them. So it's absolutely brilliant. So I would like uh, only maybe discuss a couple of points that you have already explained. So the first one is, uh, do you think that the role of the sports scientist or strength condition coach is changed compared to the beginning of your career? So now, is it different compared to before? And I would like, uh, in particular, Mm, speak about the technology because you, you talked about the technology so how could the technology uh, impact uh, obviously your work uh, for example now compared to the before so what do you think that has changed yeah I think I mean that's a great question to be honest and as soon as you said you know what's changed the first thing in my head was technology and then you said the technology so um, I think you know for me like I said coming into industry um it was a lot less, it, you know, Ada was a lot less, less saturated anyway. So it was only really probably, you know, the, the top clubs that had sports science provision when I first came into it. But ov obviously that's filtered down a lot more now. So I think there are a lot more opportunities, you know, even working down from elite to semi-pro to, to amateur clubs now, you know, still now have like SNC or sports science provision. So I think it's sort of filtered down from the, just that, you know, it being an elitist thing to now, sports science, strength conditioning, performance training. Um, you even see it in gyms now, you know, s and coaches are doing performance training with you know, amateur athletes on a Saturday morning in their local gym. So I think sort of strength conditioning has become a much bigger field rather than it being a specialist for just professional athletes. Um, so I think that's created a lot of opportunity, which is good. Um, 
and and again, it's it's become a lot more sort of as I talked about specialist as well. So there are a lot more sort of specialist roles now at the higher level, which when I first came into it, you know, weren't really about. So nutrition, I've, I mentioned it a lot, but you know, there's there's you no know, all the top clubs now will have their own sort of specific sports nutritionist. So then there's more scope for specialist areas to support within a working within a multidisciplinary team. So I think sports science teams have got bigger in terms of the different roles, but also the number of staff within a team. Um, so being at that sort of team and team, being able to work as part of a team or multidisciplinary teams become more important. Um, but yeah, ultimately, hugely the technology side of it. So I remember when I first came in the industry, um, scrapping about with polar heart rate monitors, um, thinking, wow, this is this is cutting edge. This is this is unbelievable, this this information. Um, so now that's something that we still sort of track, but you know, we have so much more uh information from the GPS data that we collect. Um, and again, there's still so much we don't even know about that. The technology even is always evolving around that. Um, we've got player management systems. So, you know, you've got loads of different sort of systems on the market now, which, which sort of brings uh, AMS systems, which brings all that information together, um, which again is more technology. From a gym based point of view, the way that's evolved in terms of things like push bands now, whereas you know, when I first came out using linear transducers with wires on bars and you know, obviously pros and cons of different technology, but it's something you can easily get left behind with. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, we, we collect so much the Nordboard data we have measuring sort of hamstring strength. Um, I do find at times as, as a practitioner, sometimes we can almost, you know, have too much information and it can actually make decisions harder um, or more complex or takes away more of your time to analyze the data. Um, a good example of that is we've just had a player that's, that's re-injured his quad from, from kick striking a ball, essentially. Um, and first time he re-injured, we must have spent, I'd say as a department, six hours as a team going through everything that he'd done, whether that was his GPS data, whether that was his gym markers. We had ice connect tested him, looking at his quad and hamstring ratios. We had measured his hamstring strength on the nor board. We had, you know, forced data on his jumps, his counter movement jumps. We even had player maker units, which actually uh, measure like your kicking velocity. So we've got all this data and, you know, we spent m multiple hours between us going through it. And then the end of it was still, so we're still sat there saying, I don't understand why he's re injured his quad. Um, so yeah, we have all this data and it, and it is useful. I think we're getting to a point for, from what, where I currently work as well, where everything's become more data driven now. Whereas previously, I'd have been more sort of data influenced, where regarding still using your sort of coaching eye and, and your gut instinct to make decisions, but having the data there to maybe guide you. Whereas now I feel like we're getting more driven towards you know, making everything fit the numbers, um, which you know, I'm not necessarily sure that that's a great place to, to be. Um, so I'm, I'm still a believer of, look, you know, as coaches, you know, you need experience, you need to build instincts and understanding of your sport and your athletes and then the data should be there to help you support decisions or you know use objectively if you need sort of set markers whether that's you know from an injury or from a performance point of view um be able to sort of benchmark your athlete and, and sort of tailor their training program really oh, brilliant thank you very much so okay, you, you have clarified all the points very well uh, i have a second question that is uh, more related to university what should the university and the lecturers, so people like me, do to better prepare our students for, uh, say, the real world, <laughs> for, uh, yeah. uh, for example, the football industry, from your point of view? So obviously you have explained a lot of things, but uh, yeah. if you have a suggestion to give to me or to the university, what do you suggest? I, I think for me now, even since I, I graduated, you know, in terms of like the, the level of, of knowledge that students are getting, you know, you guys are delivering unbelievable levels of information and knowledge for the students so you know i'm seeing students coming out a lot more knowledgeable than me from an academic point of view um I think the biggest thing that they probably lack is, is those sort of soft skills um then coaching skills where you know i remember doing it at uni where you put in pairs with your mate that you go to uni with and you're coaching him or her and you know you're not really learning like how to how to deal with a, a different human being an athlete um so for me, I think it's, you know, universities, whether it's encouraging students or having partnerships with, with, with clubs or with certain sectors that 
students can then go and gain sort of as much practical experience as possible because I think that's that for me that's the only way you develop those skills I think you can't teach people how to communicate you can't teach people how to coach in a classroom the only way you can learn those skills is by getting hands on and doing it and like I said my, my first experience at South End where as an SNC coach where you know I was like a bull in a shot I remember it clearly you know very aggressive with my approach like a bull in a china shop trying to get players doing things they don't want to do without them really understanding why they're doing it um, you know my coaching way has changed so much since then you know and but that's only through time and experience and like I said I wasn't in a position where I had someone to really learn off in that in that role so if they can get a mentor or they can get experience when they're working with a good coach who's going to give them a little bit of guidance also allow them the freedom to you know go and experiment and go and practice and for me a great place to, to probably learn that is with um whether, it, whether it's amateur or semi-pro or professional athletes but at a younger age group um so, so maybe working with children or adolescents um who are still developing still maturing and you know still learning how to move and stuff i think that's a great place to to actually learn how to coach um, and be able to sort of make a few mistakes along the way without it being too costly brilliant thank you very much and uh, honestly i agree on everything because uh, uh, when i start to work uh, uh, at the beginning, I was working like a strength condition coach or sports scientist. Uh, so you know, the terminology sometimes uh, can be can be equivalent to reality in many clubs. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, the first point was exactly that. So I had a lot of information related to obviously science, research, evidence based, the practice, but I didn't have maybe the the soft skills. And uh, yeah. I struggled at the beginning. Obviously, with time you improve, but that is a yeah. great point in my opinion. Probably is one of the the most important thing that we need to to think about in the in the universe because obviously you know we are a bit more academia driven at yeah. the country we should also watch this type of uh, of things and uh, I, I took a note <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. And no, uh, but... the last one because obviously there is so much that you say that is brilliant that um, I have a page of questions but uh, this one is the last one and after no problem no, no rush that, <laughs> is um, you, you spoke about um, a, a mentor role so what do you suggest to to the students that obviously they have maybe just finished the undergraduate or maybe a master and they need to start working in the sport industry so not only related to football so what do you suggest from a mentor point of view should they maybe maintain a, a link with the the previous lecturers uh, try to find a mentor that is already a, a practitioner uh, what do you suggest for them? Yeah, again, I, I appreciate sometimes, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do, um, to find someone that can actually spend the time to, to give you that opportunity. Uh, I think like I, I mentioned it already, but, you know, social media now is a great way um, to connect with people with, within the field or within the industry that you want to go in, uh, to do your research, find out, you know, who are the key people in that industry, speak to them as they may be able to recommend people within your area or, you know that you can connect up with and most practitioners now you know i have students contacting me saying oh look you know do you mind you know if we if we locally if we meet up for a coffee and you can i can ask you some things and and i'll show you some stuff you know some some periodization plans i've drawn up or can i email you some plans i've drawn up uh, for my sport and i'll be like yeah fine do you know what i mean no problem and you know nine times out of ten i'll try and make the time so there are there are people out there practitioners that would do that i think the best way to do that for me um, is in terms of getting yourself, whether it is, say, in a paid role or a voluntary role. I know there's a lot of debate about internships at the moment, but if you can get a good internship um, opportunity with someone in the department who would then become your mentor. Um, so what we tend to do is we run, into, we haven't done it this year because of COVID, but normally we run internship programs through the club and we'll take what, what normally a maximum of two two students and um within that within their role they'll be designed uh advise a mentor so whether that's myself or whether that's one of the other members of the department that would then sort of mentor them for that six month or season period um and then not normally sort of keep those connections um from that as well you know i've still like i said one, one of my first interns he, he's the guy i mentioned that's just gone over to australia um working with, with melbourne so you know he was he was an intern in 2011 with me um, you know, he went on, you know, after spending two, three years working alongside me, um, he actually then went on to, to Luton Town and to Stoke City and now over to, to Melbourne as sort of head of performance. So, you know, I'm not saying that's because of my mentorship, but 
you know, he took that opportunity, it was given, uh, developed, and then sort of that was his sort of footing and, and away he went. So there's different ways of doing it. Like I said, there are different mentorship programs that, that you can buy into, um, but I'm a little skeptical of some of those. Um, you know, are they there to help you? Are they there just to sort of make money? So be a little bit careful on those ones. But yeah, whether it's a university lecturer, whether it's someone in your, in your place of work, um, so whether it's for an internship, there's different ways of doing it. But um, you know, I think I think it's a useful thing to have and something I never had. Um, so I, I learned the hard way a lot of times. <laughs> It'd have been nice to, to ask someone that knew what they were doing before I did certain things. But um, sometimes you learn by your own mistakes is the best way to learn. <laughs> but um, no, so, so that, that's what I'd say on that one. No, th yeah. thank, you, thank you very much. I think uh, everything is clear. And honestly, I really enjoy your presentation.